Maharaja's table laden with dozens of dishes. A little lamb biryani saab? Or how about a delicate spinach curry or pork vindaloo? This rare gathering of princes and princesses would be surprised to learn just how much the world has been influenced by their cooking. Paris. Parisians, as they themselves would insist, are the masters of fine Western food and fashion. of courage and the clothes of the new season but Helena Rone is just a little distracted by the thought of a rather special lunch salmon au curry Georges Saint. it is being prepared for Helena with a nod to Indian cooking the first step is classically French take salmon steaks and pour on stock Monsieur Kara's next step is Indian he adds curry powder Indian cooks would stand amazed. One of the finest French chefs using a curry powder? Well... sauce is next. The Indian method ordains fish, sauce and spices be cooked together in the same pot. But at the Georges Saint, onions are followed by pieces of apple, chopped banana and then more curry powder. Monsieur Cara does not claim to cook an authentic curry. His is a French adaptation. the appointed hour. The sauce has been conjured from the spicy fruit mixture. It's been cooked and sieved and sieved again. True, it looks like an absolutely French creation, but it has that little je ne sais quoi l'endien. What Helena doesn't realize is that her special creation isn't altogether new. Once the French made real curry, learnt perhaps from their travels east, or, if anyone dare say it, from the British. Today's salmon au curry represents the new French thinking on the matter. The culinary masters have brought curry into a classically French line. Sri Lanka, the island of delights, as the place was called by the Arab merchants of old. Two thousand years ago, Sri Lanka was a honeypot for traders. The spices of the Far East, the silks of China and the gold of Europe flowed in and out. Settlers came and with them their customs. The Sri Lankans absorbed the art of curry making from the Tamils of South India. Today, fish curry and rice is everyday fare. Whole spices, fenugreek, 
mustard, cumin, coriander and chilies are roasted to give a strong, almost bitter taste and then pounded into a powder. The islanders delight in shellfish. They are common fare, although more and more go to feed the tourists. This chef at the Goldface Hotel prepares crab curry to order. The method is simple. His curry powder is but one ingredient, a base on which to build other flavours, maybe ginger, garlic and cardamom. Coconut milk makes the sauce. It comes from the flesh of the fruit, which has been grated and squeezed to release a cream. Dilute it with water and cook it carefully. The chef doesn't seem to pay overdue attention, but beware, if the milk isn't stirred until it boils, it will curdle. Tourists are relative newcomers to these seaside treats. This kind of crab curry has always been cooked and served on the beach, but to a rather different clientele. It was a traditional meal for fishermen. They indulged in some of the finest fast food in the world. British went to India in search of eastern trade and found a place enchanting so they stayed. The merchants and the soldiers and administrators shared a passion for the spicy food the local cooks prepared. Masala, biryani, takadal and vindaloo had more appeal than English stew. So when the Memsabs ventured east to civilize their men they couldn't serve plain English food again. But curry powder helped the Raj improve crab meat and fish. And soon this instant mix of spices garnished every dish. Curry powder travelled round the world from shore to shore to reach our club in Singapore. Jolly good show. A living monument to the old colonial Raj, Raffles Hotel. A hotel with a worldwide reputation for its extraordinary Britishness. It is fitting that the hotel takes its name from Sir Stamford Raffles, for he planted Britannia's flag on Singapore Island. In the hotel of his name, British gentlemen have had their needs properly served. The curry lunch has always been a Raffles triumph. Today, a Chinese cook carries on the tradition, but the curry making is, well, pucker. Curry powder is the basis of every one of his curries. It's blended specially to suit the tastes of the British guests. Water is the only other essential, according to the cook. Garlic bubbling in a wok. Well, that's typical for a curry cooked in Singapore, a meeting place of so many nations. Curry cooking British style demands the spice mixture first to be fried, the water just stops it burning. Fruit is another British must. Apple slices take away any bitterness and add a tang. The Indians use yoghurt for the same purpose. The British, however, feel at home with something rather more familiar. Giant fresh prawns in their shells are a passion, whether they are familiar or not. The extraordinary quality of seafood made the gentlemen of Singapore the envy of an empire. Yeah. 
step back to the turn of the century for the serving of a tiffin curry lunch. Every Sunday, such a spread is laid out in honour of the past. Tiffin is an Anglo-Indian word for a light lunch. Although light hardly seems the right word. Some beef and curry, sir? Yes, sure. Or perhaps you would prefer chicken, fish, tomatoes or aubergine, each adorned in its own curry powder sauce. My word, what a fantastic meal, isn't it, eh? Good enough there, Chris. I think I can probably suffer that. <laughs> The British have never lost the taste for their kind of curry. And given a chance, the old hands return here to introduce their children and their grandchildren to this shrine of British curry powder curries. <laughs> well, when I was a boy out in Hong Kong, the Indians used to make Madras curry, and they used to make it in the stone pots with the great big thumping stick, and make their own uh, curry powders and put all the spices in and that. And they used to curry chicken. And one of the finest curries I had was curry goat, believe it or not. Curried goat? Well, this brings us to the island of Jamaica. Parties in Jamaica boast the best of everything. What a spread! Slices of breadfruit, fried green banana, and cocoa root, and the goat curry. It's all Jamaican made with locally produced curry powder, rum, molasses, and unripe mangoes. Curried goat made with curry powder? Now, you think the British brought it here too? Well, you would be wrong, because the clue to the origin of Jamaican curry lies in one of the island's more comfortable villas. Mr. Sukanam's family manufactures a popular local curry powder. Indian spices are ground and blended to suit the Jamaican taste. So, how did that come about, Mr. Sukhanam? When we look back to 1838, when slavery was abolished in Jamaica, the British government and planters of Jamaica at that time, they got permission from the British government to bring Indian labor on a denture system here. And from that time, we've been having Indians all the time up to about 20 years ago, they stopped immigration here. Now, at that time, Jamaicans didn't know nothing about curry. The Indians brought uh, the recipe along with them when they came here. The Jamaicans, little by little, were invited to have curry goat party. And since that time, curry goat is a very popular national dish of Jamaica. The island of Bali, where Indian traders came long before recorded time. Rice is the main food, and Indian spices an essential flavoring. But spices are not the only Indian legacy, for Hinduism is the religion and has been for 2,000 years. That is just the start of a birthday celebration. 
Across the family compound, preparations are underway for the party. Ketut Lakong selects some lemongrass, a local flavouring. He's one of the poor relations and has to earn his invitation by masterminding the feast. Lemongrass goes into his speciality. The Balinese festival dish, Bebek Tutu, hot smoked duck to you. Ketut sleeps on the table when he's not using it for cooking. Now to the local herbs he adds red chilies and other Indian spices. A little coriander, cloves and sesame seeds as well as three kinds of pepper. There are 20 varieties altogether, a hodgepodge of fresh and dried. Now Ketut is doing something that millions of Indians do every day. He is making a masala, gauging just what quantities will bring the finest flavours. But this is not the beginning of a conventional curry. Blended with water, the spices are rubbed into a duck. But this method would be no surprise to many Indians. All down the east coast of India, whole fish are prepared just like this, even to the detail of wrapping the prize in a banana leaf. Half a day of gentle cooking on a coconut husk fire and the scene is set for an extraordinary birthday celebration. Oh, those are rice husks, by the way. Anuk Agung Gade Rama Dalam, to give him his full title, is 22 years old today. But in Bali, it's his 44th birthday, as birthdays come twice a year. Sisters, brothers and cousins come to celebrate, or at least to eat a good meal. And they are all blissfully unaware that they have the inspiration of India to thank for the feast. Britain, a midsummer's day, and Jill White is about to show the ghosts of the Raj something about curry making. That emporium of spices, the local Asian supermarket, is where she begins her lesson. Good morning. Good morning. Her hunt is not for curry powder, but for individual spices. And she will then concoct her own mixture. Today, she's not looking for whole spices, to save time, she's choosing the ready ground variety. A fresh chilli is the only exception. Not too much, please, for the British palate. Jill's spices are for a surprising occasion. Her village is holding a summer fete, a peculiarly English institution. And the residents have all agreed to break with tradition and experiment with something new, a curry stall. Jill is maitre de curry, organising, cooking, blending, a kind of dish that's different but appealing. Neither her grandmother's cookbook nor the empire inspired her. It was the Asians living in Britain. Just mix your spices and you get a flavour precisely to your taste, she was advised. Be brave, a handful, not a teaspoonful. Beware only of chilli powder. Too much overwhelms other flavours if you're not used to the heat. Buy the spices fresh. Don't rely on any old ones.
After some failures, her system is now perfected, but Jill doesn't follow her Indian teachers slavishly. She always takes the meat, today it's pieces of chicken, and rolls it in the powder, a method that would raise an Indian eyebrow or two. The meat follows the onion into the pan. Under the heat, the powder becomes a kind of sticky coat for the chicken. And there is one acknowledgement to the Raj, the fruit. Tinned pineapple goes into a sauce of sieved tomato and sweet peppers to finish this new style British curry. Down the road, curry powder is spooned into mayonnaise. Susan Young is also cooking new style for the store. And hers is an unusual kind of cold curry that the French in particular would admire. In goes chopped celery, pieces of red-skinned apples, and just a taste of crushed onion. Cooked chicken finishes off this summer delight. Coronation chicken. The Indians, too, agree that this uncurry-like curry, invented for the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II, does have its merits. All it takes is a little taste of India to brighten everyone's day.